morning. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's working. A very, very good morning to all of you. Uh, today we are on the World Theatre Forum on the second day and the uh, uh, fourth session. Yesterday we had the keynote by uh, Professor Udayan Bajpayee and then had two wonderful sessions which we, where we had discussed the idea of contemporary and various positions of looking at it. Uh, today uh, we will be talking about the tropes and scopes of uh, the newness, the theatre, performance, visual art, film in different areas, how the new uh, ideas are coming up and how for those new and new, how for those new needs to be uh, re-looked at again. And uh, I am very, very happy that today we have uh, one of uh, all of our dearest professor Anuradha Kapoor, Dr. Anuradha Kapoor with us uh, as the chair of this session. Uh, she uh, had remained the uh, director of this institute. Uh, she had retired from that post, but before that she had remained uh, the professor in this institute for 34 years. So generation 32. She is very particular, <laughs> almost like an in she looks at performance almost with the skill of an investigative journalist. <laughs> so she is very particular about everything. So 32 years of teaching, so you can pretty well imagine that she has trained and inspired generations and generations of artists. And uh, she herself is an academician, a theater maker. Uh, many of her works had been uh, made and shown all over the world in different continents, in many, many different countries. Uh, some of her theoretical writings are uh, earmarks for academic readings all over the world. And uh, she is also the author of uh, the famous book uh, on the Ramlila of Ramnagar, the actor's pilgrims, um, gods, uh, and kings. And kings. <laughs> I always feel nervous in front of me. <laughs> and um, one of her new book is forthcoming, and that is forthcoming for quite some time, and we hope <laughs> that's your sister. <laughs> her book is very soon forthcoming, and we're all eagerly waiting for her new forthcoming book. Uh, and the two speakers, I uh, apologize to the audience that uh, the third speaker, Ms. Daksha Set, uh, who was supposed to speak in this session, she, is not, uh, she has not been able to come. Uh, she had been unwell and uh, she had written to us yesterday that uh, she regretted uh, her coming. We would surely try to get her on another occasion so that we can listen to her positions. Uh, but we have with us two uh, most distinguished artists at this point. Uh, one is Flavia Bartram. I do not know, many of you must have seen her performance uh, yesterday at Sri Ram Centre. Uh, Flavia Bartram is one of the founding members of Hoax and a physical theatre performer who trained in corporeal mime. She has worked with Theatre Renault Budget Theatre uh, pro uh, proactive Dance, Twisted Heap, One Test Cabaret, and One Taste Theatre's Buster Silver Screen Daydreams, commissioned by Happy Days, International Beckett Festival, Enniskillen. Recent hoax credits include Stuck, 2017, Hysterical, 2016, Track on Tours, The Ugliest Buildings in London, 2014 and 15, and this production. Please take a kind note of this, that this production is in association with the London Festival of Architecture. <laughs> the ugliest buildings in London. Uh, and The Lonely Room 2014. A very, very warm welcome to Flavia. And then, of course, we have Anna Dora Dorno, the director, actress and theatre pedagogue. She is an Italian actress, director and theatre pedagogue. She graduated at the University of Bologna, Department of Music and Performance. And she got a degree in acting at the Academy of Dramatic Arts. 
she took a special degree in physical and experimental theater within Santa Cargelo Festival Educational Program. In 2004, she founded the theater company in Stavli Vaganti, directing and acting in several international touring and multi-awarded performances, receiving the nomination at the Total Theater Awards at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival 2014 for the show Made in Ilva. I hope that many of you have also seen, seen the show uh, a few days back. Medin Elva. She holds workshops and work sessions on the performer's physical and vocal training all over the world in academies and programs such as the Atelier of the Grotowski Institute in Roklo, Poland, Shanghai Theatre Academy, China, National School of Drama, India, the uh, International Workshop Festival and the Busan International Performing Arts Festival, South Korea, the 8th and 9th International Meeting of National Drama Schools in Mexico City promoted by UNESCO ITI, the International Physical Fest of Liverpool and the Old Vic Theatre in London, UK, the 24 Hours Festival of El Kef Tunisia, INAI, Instituto Nacional de Arte Escenicas uh, Uruguay. <laughs> I'm very afraid that there is a gentleman sitting straight from Uruguay here and can exactly point out uh, my bad Spanish. Uh, furthermore, uh, she taught theatre and gave lecture in, lectures in many universities. Those worth mentioning are Bologna University, Italy, University of Kent, uh, UK, Keung Sang University and Hosea University, South Korea. Uh, Babes Boliai, Romania, UNAM and Universidad uh, Vera Cruzana, Mexico, Universidad de Chile de, in Santiago. From 2006, she is directing the International Performing Arts Projects, Rags of Memory, leading work sessions for international teams of performers and artists in different countries since 2011. She is the Artistic Director of Performazioni International Workshop Festival in Bologna. And from 2013, she is directing the International Laboratory at the Physical Theatre School of uh, Bologna. And a very, very warm welcome to Anna as well. And we also have a few more distinguished guests, uh, a little bit from all over the world, uh, who will be speaking on other sessions. Uh, we have Mr. Nicola, Nicola Pianzola, who is a director actor from Italy. Uh, we have Mr. Akia Anzi, who is a performer, uh, performance maker and uh, visual artist from Israel and India. <laughs> and we also have Lisa, Lisa Vassi, who is a designer, uh, both in, as costume and fashion from Spain. And we have Mr. Sergio Blanco, who is from uh, Uruguay and Paris, <laughs> France. Uh, and uh, he's a very, very well-known playwright. And uh, we are very happy to invite all these people. And I can see some of the faces of the students and also a very warm welcome to the other listeners. And Dignitat is present here. I would now request uh, Dr. Anuradha Kapoor to kindly take the chair and lead the session. Thank you very much, Shantanu. Uh, just to uh, gloss uh, a little bit, I think it was an extremely bloated uh, biography that Shantanu put for me. So please take it with several pinches of salt and several pinches, or in fact, several sacks of salt. Uh, he's prone to have an exaggerated uh, uh, relationship to the microphone. So. Uh, 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 it's a great pleasure to be here, and I shall be. Um, I mean, it'll be a. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for two reasons. One, that any kind of discussion uh, on theatre practice at on the occasion of a of a large uh, event such as uh, theatre Olympics is very generative and is very full of a kind of series of ideas that are actually happening right in front of us. That's one part. And the other part, of course, is that any kinds of uh, ideas and changes about what is happening around us is something that we need always to think. I'm not going to um, take too much time. I just thought I might gloss the tropes, the meaning of the way the 
the, the, the session is named. And since we might want to think about tropes, which they are figures of speech, then it would be uh, in it, inherent in the title looks to me the fact that is the trope becoming a formula or is the trope becoming something like uh, uh, an easy option? Is it only a figure of speech or is it turning in various ways uh, to produce a different kind of view to what may be happening around us? And it would also seem to me that the contradictory position is also true that the, if we seem to think that if anything becomes a trope then it's already not new would also be a problematic position because then uh, as we know the anxiety of the new is also something that pursues us greatly and has done and I think has had a long and honorable history about how not to be pursued by and pursuing the new. So it's just I hope very much that many ideas will come through and we can actually um, think through these ideas about the solidification of newness as well as the anxiety of it. Um, it will be my pleasure to invite Flavia to share her ideas. Thank you very much. Um, so, it's 23 degrees. I feel the spray. Blue whales dart around my ankles and the current swirls around my ears. And between those whales, I see an eye, not unlike a beat my own. My heart skips a beat and my tectonic plates rearrange themselves. A car is trapped in my belly button and a vibration of screams courses up my outstretched legs. Magnums for the winners and the rest in desolation. So that little excerpt is something that comes from a recent piece of theater called Stuck, which you see on the screen. Um, we began the piece in 2017. Um, and in it, audience members are invited to laugh and witness three fates who are stuck between their memories, their fantasies, and their present day predicament. It's part art, art installation, part absurdist theater, uh, which uses clown rhetoric and soft sculpture to examine our present day stuckness around the way that we culturally treat climate change questions. Um, it was devised with a clown director and an eco-sonographer, and we unpick what is the end of the world in that piece. But that's what it is now, and it's definitely not how the piece stuck began. So we began the piece three years ago, and we set out to ask the question, how do we go forward together with climate change in theater? Uh, a difficult and uh, large question. So obviously it took us several years to kind of come to where we are today. Um, and so we set out there with a copy of Jules Verne's book, Journey to the Center of the Earth, which was our starting point, um, into an idealistic mi mission through tricky territory of theater and climate change. But why did we choose this book? And its title is the reason why we chose it, because it is a journey and we wanted to get to the heart of something and we wanted to get to a heart, the heart of our understanding of our relationship to the planet Earth. Um, but perhaps even more importantly, the book itself is um, a real celebration of the spirit of scientific inquiry and curiosity 
an examination, most importantly, um, of a hopeless and optimistic, shameless attachment to the fantastical. Um, and it was a necessary antidote to what lay ahead of us. And on that journey, our first major discovery, uh, our first major discovery was that climate change functions very much like a dystopian future narrative. And while it isn't a, a dystopian fictional future narrative, if we remove the real world implications from uh, what we hear in our daily lives around climate change, it does function psychologically in the same way. Um, so the, the term dystopia was coined by John Stuart Mill in a parliamentary speech in 1868, and it re refers to an anti-utopia, um, and it, he used it to denounce the Irish government's land use policies. And then this term went on to be adopted by literary traditions where authors like George Orwell, Ray Bradbury, and Yigivienzi Yamazi, Yam Yamatin and Margaret Atwood projected present-day tendencies into catastrophic future apocalypse. And that is very much what we hear in our daily lives when we think about climate change. So I'm just going to give you some facts that compound this. So the planet's average surface temperature has risen 2 degrees Fahrenheit since the late 19th century. Most of the warming has occurred in the past 35 years, with 16 of the warmest years on record occurring since two, two, uh, 20, 2001. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the acidity of the surface ocean's waters has increased by 30%. The Antarctic, Antarctica has lost about 152 cubic kilometers of ice between 2002 and 2005. Global warming is causing extreme weather changes, has shown its implications in the way of forest fires, heat waves, and severe tropical storms throughout the world. And decisions affecting social and ecological outcomes are controlled by a small group of people surrounded by a fortress of bureaucracy. So that's our dystopic context. And this narrative kind of began to come into cultural, at least in the Western world, into cultural common parlance with movies like Inconvenient Truth and the beginning of the eco-disaster the day after tomorrow and other films like that. But as I said, <clears throat> climate change isn't a piece of speculative fiction. It is real and it is present. And ecologies are changing, the ice caps are melting, and people are dying. And this is the key difference for the imagination between other dystopian uh, realities and speculative fictions that we hear. It is real. And it is so urgent and so vast and so complex that it's difficult to take creative distance and condense, a, condense it down to create a coherent plot structure or um, artistic line of questioning. Perhaps what we might need is an epic piece on the scale of War and Peace or a durational piece like Einstein on the Beach to really lend credence to this topic. But let's go back to simple theater, or quote unquote simple theater. Um, 1984 by George Orwell, which was adapted onto the stage um, to sell out audiences in the past year in London. Um, works in bo both in literature and on, say, on stage because its basic premise is simple and linear. It has a central protagonist, Winston Smith. He finds himself in accidental opposition to the system he lives in, and therein lies the clear conflict, man's nature versus an inflexible system. Herein, a system is so tightly woven and in order to fulfill our most, most basic instinct of survival, man must subsume his other instincts and capacities. But climate change has so many strands and potential themes, where on earth does one begin? And it seems that with climate change theater, at least in London, um, what happens, what the first trend was to make scientists the archetypal climate change protagonist. 
Here we see in Greenland, which was at the National Theatre in 2011, the intermingling of the personal and the global. Um, so the main, the main protagonist of this show was a scientist carrying out research in Greenland, and it looked at um, the actual science and put him in that context and his interpersonal problems of not being heard with those around him. Um, it was directed by Bijen Shabin, uh, Shabani, and authored by Moira Buffin, Matt Chairman, Penelope Skinner, and Jack Thorne. So it was a collective effort. Other attempts have been 10 Billion, which is at the Royal Court in 2012, which was directed by Katie Mitchell. There she put um, a scientist, Professor Stephen Emmett, on stage, and he essentially was in a set that looked like his office, and he informed us of the contents of his research. So it was functioned more as a lecture within a thea theatrical context than as um, a piece of narrative theater. Likewise, a, a few years later, she put another scientist on stage in 2071. This time, um, it was scientist Chris Rapley, and he, um, he recounted his experiences as a, a climate change scientist. Um, of not being heard, of the urgency that he believes around it, as well as looking to how he, he would feel and how he would speak to his granddaughter, um, which is why it was pe the piece is called 2071, because it's about the legacy of climate change and what we're leaving our children. And again, the piece functions slightly as uh, a lecture, but with more um, interpersonal storytelling woven in throughout the piece. But to many people, this kind of theater functions more like a public service announcement and disregards all of the, em or many of the empathy stirring techniques that is inherent in the theatrical form. Um, for example, we cry when we, when two, albeit silly star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet take their lives because we as audiences have been molded and shaped by the playwright director um, designer and the actors to be completely immersed in that world and have our heart ripped out. It is effective storytelling for its own purpose. When the audience clap, the play is complete. But with these climate change plays, we as audience members carry that unease uh, out of the theater and back into the re real world where we have no recourse for action. So these, pe these pieces designed to galvanize us don't provide us with the closure that we a good piece of theatre often provides. Um, so in the previous pieces cite cited, and as many others, the performance, as one critic wrote, is not so much a play as an intellectual extravaganza. The facts and figures behind these climate change plays, their future dystopian narratives, hold on, have a hold on our imaginations that can be paralyzing, most importantly because of the way in which it has been discussed up to date, is speculative, is premon premonitionary, I don't know if that's a word, but I've decided it is. Uh, its premonitionary urgency requires empathy for an abstracted future desire, disaster, and it's difficult to engage the heart when the mind is reprogramming behaviors through a compelling sense of duty rather than a deep felt and emotionally driven desire. So does science make for a compelling theory? All theater, all signs point to no. Our collaborator on Stuck says, theater is a life-affirming medium that involves people coming together in a social space and sharing an experience. This, is, this does not naturally lend itself to climate change, which is an anti-social subject. It is boring for people unless you sensationalize it. It is negative and sad. It produces fear. It is a dramatic scenario, but it fails some kind of, <clears throat> it fails some kind of authenticity, authenticity test for being too real. I'm just gonna have a sip of water. <laughs> But I'm not so sure that I agree with him. Um, since 2015, there seems to be <clears throat> there seems to have been a shift away from, from which from this kind of dealing with climate change, and creatives seem to have 
actually allowed themselves to get really creative. So for example, um, you have Interstellar, uh, Christopher Nolan's epic work about a pilot who takes a mission connected to a project looking for a new home for the human race. It deals, the, play, the movie deals with gritty interpersonal relationships, questions of duty and family legacy, and of course, a bit of quantum time travel. Um, he really, have, has, has anybody seen the film? He really allowed himself to, to really chew on, that, on climate change questions, but it doesn't feel like a climate change movie, and I think that's what makes it so powerful. It is an incredible piece of filmic artistry. Um, and then we also have films like Mad Max, which blends future questions of social structure, land ownership, and general, gender relations through a shoot 'em up survival story. And likewise, the um, Israeli artist Isaac Cordell he installs 15 to 25 centimeter tall sculptures in streets and public spaces across Europe, and then he photographs them to document their presence. These miniaturized scenes are often arranged as site-specific street art interventions. And in his own words, he says the work refers to this collective inertia that leads us to think that our small actions cannot change anything. But I believe that every small act can contribute to a big change. Many small changes can, can, can bring back social attitudes that manipulate the global inertia and turn it into something more positive. And it's no coincidence that this piece went viral on uh, social media as politicians discussing global warming when the piece is actually called Cement Eclipse, demonstrating that audiences are surprising well attuned and are able to give works new leases of life. In 2015, at Ursula Le Guin was at a conference um, and she was speaking about future narratives. And she said, if you can make it up, you can open the doors. Thus far, climate change narratives operate with closed doors. And as we've seen in past years, more recently in Britain and the United States, facts don't stir hearts and minds, artifice does. So I'm happy to see that artists are beginning to really chew on the artifice in order to tell a good quality climate change stories. But back to Stuck. In 2016, we worked with Richard Pettifer, who was, uh, who's the one who was very, who I referenced earlier, and we renamed our show from Journey into Stuck, because none of us could see how we could reconcile the dilemma that, the dilemma that Richard spoke of um, in a way that we would be happy putting it on stage. So we made a rule. As devising actors, we not only had to check our personal lives at the door, we also had to check our political desire to make climate change real and to make people aware that it's happening here and now. But on un doing so, we unwittingly stumbled upon the key that would unlock our imaginations and allow us to make work like Christopher Nolan and the Mad Max movies. Um, we allowed ourselves to take the climate change narrative out of scientific hands and tell our story. We embraced the absurdity of the situation and temporarily encased our bodies in rock formations and became talking heads. An idea that didn't stay for very long, but it's something that allowed us to have, have, have fun and play. We finally really began to play. Our job as theater makers is to connect with our audiences and tell a story and a story that just ha a story that just happens to involve themes connected to our ecological predicament this is not a vehicle for sharing facts or educating the public theater making requires trust its most basic exercises are designed to build it it requires that there is no us, and it requires that it, there is no them. No, we need to tell people about this very important thing. And the them is the audience in that dichotomy. All too often in creative circles, when we were carrying out our research, we heard this division. We need to tell people 
that we need to change things. The urgency of the desire to make work that dealt with this topic was creating a barrier between audience members and the creatives that were on stage or making their own work. And no audience member, myself included, wants to be reminded of a sensation of being in a classroom with a moralizing teacher telling us how we should behave. We want to feel equal to those we see before us. We want to feel engaged and we want to feel connected. And it seems that in the creation of climate change work, the question of trusting the audience has been one of its biggest downfalls in terms of creating new work capable of expanding our collective understanding of global ecological system and future narratives. The three basic rules of audience relations, trust that they will understand, signposting as means of caring for them, and take pleasure in what you're doing so that they can relax and joy seems to have gone by the wayside. But likewise, while we've been doing all this work on climate change, we are also, Hoax is also um, an artistic group that's highly involved in immersive theater in London. And perhaps that is one of the keys to unpicking this question of how we can go forward together with theater and climate change. So for those that aren't familiar with immersive theater in any in-depth way, um, I'm gonna look at London specifically because that's where I'm from. Um, over the past 10 years in London, theatre makers have been repositioning audiences in various ways for creative questioning as well as for financial reasons. Um, artists have been starting to work more and more outside of traditional venues and outside of black box theatre contexts. And breaking the fourth wall isn't new, but the popularization and the scale of immersive theatre that's happening is. So immersive theatre, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a participatory theatrical form where audience members give up their observer status to become co-creators and co-actors in the narrative and the storytelling process. Examples of such work include uh, company Punch Drunk, who are based out of Tottenham in London. Um, what they do is they create these massive, fantastical sets um, and audience, uh, that audiences can roam around in, and there are performances that happen throughout the evening um, in different rooms. It's very easy to get lost in the scale of their sets. But what's really exciting about what they do is all the audience members wear masks, as you can see in the image. And those masks serve to create anonymity and free the audience from any codes of conduct and behavior. But also, they become a chorus for all the other audience members to watch. You can watch people wa watching, watching the action. And that in and of itself creates an incredible distancing effect from what, what is witnessed in front of, what you witness as, a, as an audience member. These massive spectacles can, can be either really exhilarating for the viewers or very disappointing. So if you happen to catch on to some of the action, you manage to follow a pathway through um, all these stories, these interconnecting stories. But if you're like me and you're very obstinate and you want to have your own experience, it's very easy to miss all of the action and just be wandering around in a fantastical set. So depending on who you are and how you engage with theatre, it can be, th these performances can be uh, either frustrating or really exciting, but you do get what you give, and that's what's most exciting about it, is that it's very much your own experience and what you make of it, and you're on your feet. Um, and then this is it's actually a, a Belgian company called, on, I don't know how to pronounce their name, Entre Rend Good, and they do one-on-one uh, -on -one experiences where audience members are blindfolded and taken on a sensory a sensory journey um, with people whispering into their ears, people touching their arms, and it's very much an exploration into intimacy, vulnerability, and trust. Um, and there again, it is very much about testing personal boundaries, about your, your agency, giving up your agency as an audience member, and also opening up your senses to new, new experiences and new concepts of theatre. Um, 
in 2014's The Tack on Tours, The Ugliest Building in London that we did as hoax. It is an immersive walking tour where some people were aware when they signed up, some people weren't so much of, of the fact that this was actually a theatre piece. And so we uh, have historically accurate information on the tour, but we also bend and shape it to make an interesting theatrical journey. And along the way, the two guides, Pamela and Charlene, begin to exhibit increasingly ugly behaviors. So it's a meditation on ugliness, but it's also um, a meditation on how we look and how we perceive our aesthetic environment. What this, these high-vis vests serve to perform the same function as the punch drunk masks um, in terms of uh, the being watched, the many levels of being watched because a lot of the participants um, at, at moments of high drama feel incredibly uncomfortable because they're being associated with my character has a giant breakdown in the middle of the road and because they have these vests to the outside world they are part of this performance and it is uncomfortable because they have very little way of distancing themselves from what's happening visually. Um, so it's about being watched and watching and all of that stuff. But what's interesting in, that, in this audience context is the fact that the audience have a very clear role that they're entering into. They are participants on a walk. They know how they should behave. They feel safe because they have a code of conduct for them that allows them to relax and enjoy the ride. Um, and there's also space for them to actually have interpersonal connections as well as the theatrical engagement with us. Um, and then something that's it's not so much immersive, but it's also about breaking the, the fourth wall, is looking at the way that new clown work is happening. And this is a piece by um, the woman who directed us for Stuck, called Powerful Women Are About, and it's a ritualized clown piece that looks at um, mythos and logos and ritual and ritual functions and how they work and how we can create rituals with our audiences through and this happens to be through comedy and so that brings us back to stuck as an immersive theater company primarily we chose actually to locate stuck back in the black box because we wanted our piece to be about cultural constructs specifically. So we can either be in gallery spaces or in black box spaces, but we wanted to set up the formality of that encounter and be able to break it through clowning techniques. <laughs> and we, what we wanted to do was also to, to create, we created one central metaphor, but we left a lot of space, lots of patches of white so that the audience can re-engage with, with theater and climate change and kind of give them a bit of space so that they can um, they can really enjoy what's happening in front of them. We've left it purposely an open-ended piece. I'm not saying it's you know the be-all and end-all climate change work but we've left it quite open-ended so that audience members can take away what they want from it and uh, reinterpret their understanding of how we can talk about climate change. And then that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so thank you for coming, and thank you um, at the National School of Drama to invite us here. Um, I want to start uh, this conversation um, to this sentence that was uh, sending uh, by message to us, my company, my theatre company, Stabili Vaganti, after the workshop that we did here with the students. Uh, one student write me, Thanks for such a wonderful workshop. Thanks for giving us something new. So something new. What can be new? Oh, what can be newness? So for us, for the students, for everybody. Um, it seems to me that it's something very, um, very individual. 
So it's something that depends on our experience. So what is new for us students, of course, is not new for me. If I need to teach something to, to a student, I use something that I know very well. So that it becomes from my work that I know that I can teach. So it's not new for me, but maybe it's new for them. And this is very important because it means that what is new is depending of uh, our experience, it depending of the context in which we are, it depends of uh, a culture that we become. Um, for example, something of, of the tradition of a culture can be new for me, and of course it's, it's not new, for example, for you. And I think uh, that is, in this particular um, time, in the contemporary time, this is very important because something was changing um, in the communication. We, are, we, we can communicate in a way that is very fast. We have many, many possibilities to communicate with different sources. We can communicate with internet, social network, and so on. Um, this, um, this changed the perception that we have of the, of the world. It seems to us that we know everything, but it's not so true. It seems to us that we can know um, everything all over the world, but it's uh, something so, so in the surface. And so we need to go deep to know for real some, something about a culture, uh, a different culture, um, to work, for example, with different artists. And I think that um, the newness for me, for, uh, for the work that we am doing in my company, is to investigate something becoming from different tradition, to go deep, to understand what there is out of me, to try to understand. But of course, it's something I know for me. And so it's new in my vision. But to be new also for the people that is looking, for example, uh, my, my work, uh, what, I, what, what I need to do. I think uh, that the important things is to be free, to express what I think, to express my creativity in a such, in a such a freedom um, situation, because um, the, the society uh, um, nowadays is conditioned, uh, conditioned, is conditioned a lot our work, our reaction, and to be free to express uh, without uh, constriction what we think for real is a very difficult task. So, uh, I think that in my theater it's very important uh, the social function of what I try to transmit. And to, to let people um, be involved in, uh, in something also political, to take a position, to be with us. And this is very important because to involve the audience is not only uh, to let them stay inside, a, um, uh, to, to let's say inside that work of, uh, to, to stay in the scene, for example, or uh, to, to collaborate, 
but it's also to be engaged, to try to, um, to be, try to be. And this is very, very, very difficult task, I think. And um, is is something that is not so um, present nowadays in uh, in uh, our society. We can look, we can do what we want, but without being involved. We can stay out. Um, so what I think can be create um, a new way of work is to be for real involved in something. So then um, it's not only important to create something new, but also to communicate, to find a way to communicate this newness in a different way. So for example, in our play Made in Ilva, that somebody maybe, maybe so, uh, or maybe with uh, the, in the yesterday speaking of Nicola, maybe saw the video. Um, we didn't think about to, to create something different, something new. But many, many times people are saying to us, oh, this is very new work. Or, for example, um, critics and um, um, they give to us some specific category that maybe in Italian theater doesn't exist before. They were speaking uh, about biomechanic, contemporary biomechanic, watching our play. But we didn't work in biomechanic. We didn't come from this. But of course, it seems that uh, when you create something that can be new, immediately it's necessary to give a category to define what we are doing. And so I think in that moment, for example, the troops are coming. And uh, we can look in a different ways, for example, our work. This definition was uh, uh, looking at the play, but in a, in a, um, for the um, for what the play is transmit uh, in a physical way. But somebody else was was speaking and uh, say that this kind of work is a civil commitment emotional theater. So very long definition. And, and of, course, of course for us is not to be in this category, is to express what we want to what we want to express, if to be free to tell uh, what we want to express. And another important thing of uh, our work is um, the fact that we are not considering ourselves as creator of something different or new, but always we, we, we work with the pace that is our tradition we watch our tradition, we, we, we base our work on that. And also to other tradition. Because uh, a very important thing for us is the dialogue between tradition. So I think that the new is start when these traditions are real in dialogue. Because they are combined something that before was not. So the intercultural dialogue became um, a very important way for us to work. And we start to involve. We are basically two people, so me and Nicola working. 
So then, um, in our project, always we open the project to other people, to involve, uh, to have a different view. And then, with this dialogue, with this intercultural dialogue, we can create something different. Um, in the project, Rags of Memory, that we created uh, 12 years ago, for example, um, the, important, the very important thing is this dialogue. We start to do a sort of a work session, international work session, inviting people coming from all over the world to share with us the concept of uh, our uh, project, that it, in that case is working on memory uh, in different ways, individual memory, historical memory, uh, anthropological, anthropological memory. And we start to uh, examine um, part of uh, tradition coming uh, from all over the world, because actor and dancer and artist that join the session are coming um, from different country, and we try to understand how we can communicate, how can be the base of the communication of the theater, dance, but also like human being. So the essence of the communication that is inside the action, the rhythm, uh, the dance. And we try to contaminate also the languages, to create a sort of new vocabulary that can be our vocabulary, the vocabulary of the people working in that project, but of course that can be also universal, understandable for everybody, and introducing this kind of new communication. The sessions are um, basically a period of work, intensive work, um, that can be one week, two weeks, ten days, very intensive, in which we work with uh, other professional actor performance and, and so on in a place in the world. So we did this session in Italy, in Mexico, in Korea, in, in India also. And sharing our tradition, our, our work, we start to understand that there is something very deep, very common. And uh, these elements are very small things. Maybe it's a specific step, maybe a sort of rhythm that can be understandable for everybody. In uh, this session, of course, we create at the end uh, also a work, a performance, to try to fix what we reach in this period of research. That can be a point that we use to go further in the other session. So I want to show a video that resumes 10 years of this work with different sources, different sessions that we did all over the world.
So basically, um, the base of uh, of the communication on this project is the action, the physical action, the dance, the music. Um, so all these aspects, the, this very important also the songs, singing. So all um, these elements that can be uh, important, can be the base for the communication in between um, communication between the artists, but also communication with the audience. So the important things is the human being in the, in the middle, in the center of the work, that try to communicate outside. So, as, um, as a director, researcher and pedagogue, I think that is very important the, to approach, to transmit what we try to research to, the, to other people in a different level. So, with other artists, for example, then with students and then with the audience. And this can be create a narration, um, a different kind of narration, uh, in a way, in a contemporary way. So in a way that can be fluid, can be in movement, uh, not fixed in something very straight, but alive. Something can, can be liquid as our contemporary, as um, for example, Sigmund Bogman as saying that this contemporary is liquid because we need to be free, we need to be uh, fast, we need to pass to one thing to another thing. This kind of approach, a little bit different, um, we start to use it in another project, Megalopolis project. So, um, this project is based on a reflection about the globalization in our era and especially uh, what the globalization is doing, is, the, is provoking in a big city. And we were working in different big cities all over the world, doing workshops with students, for example, and uh, at the beginning of this project to understand which, um, what, can, what, can, what they want to speak, so which themes emerging from them. And uh, we found that uh, especially some themes are emerging, like, for example, the fear uh, to lose the um, individuality, uh, to, to disappear, to be in a mess, um, so this, this kind of themes, I think, that appear in every city in which we were working. But, for example, in uh, Mexico City, there was uh, a very specific theme that was appeared, the fear to disappear. And so it was very specific and different also, because it's a theme that we didn't um, didn't appear in other city. So we decided to explore more this theme and to understand why there was this fear. If you go in Mexico City, but in Mexico, or, uh, you can look everywhere um, like posters with missing people. Maybe when you go out uh, of the underground and so on, you can miss it, uh, you, you can find everywhere. So we decided to go deep on this theme and uh, to understand how we can be related with this. And at a certain point, when we were in Italy, we received, we received um, from students um, an important uh, um, news that was about, uh, 20, uh, about 43 students disappeared in Mexico. And they were speaking with us, they were 
they were telling us that what um, was happening and uh, how this fear become concrete. So we decided to enter in this team, to investigate this team, but not only because we want to speak about a problem that it's not, for example, our problem as a country, but for two different reasons. One is because we love Mexico as a country, we worked a lot there, and uh, we want to um, we want to create something about this love that we have for this country. And second one, because we try to create a sort of a structure in which not only us can express this issue, but Mexican artists can be involved, can have a space to tell what in that moment was happening in Mexico. Because um, as I did before, the freedom is a very difficult thing. It's depending of also of political, of, of the society, of the environment. So in that time, Mexican artists doesn't have the possibility to tell what they think about this specific topic, this team, about the 43 students disappeared. So we can take the risk as a foreigner to speak about this and to ask them before in Italy working with us and spread the information and then to, to go in Mexico with the performance and to open the performance to invite Mexican artists, especially two dancers um, coming from a, a company, a Mexican company, to work with us and to express with their language what they think about these questions. But also to open to the students to join, to be part of the performance, to be a sort of chorus of the performance and to be involved directly with the workshop and then with the performance to tell what they think about and to open more to the audience with a master class and to speak with them to understand also what they need, what they want to say in this environment. So to build a structure that can be open to different level, involve different things, different artists. Also an Italian artist was involved, a photographer that did a work uh, um, about this, uh, this thing. And I think that uh, this is very important because we recreate a sort of a, a community around the a theater around uh, a performance or a specific uh, uh, question that our performance is creating, that it's open different possibility involving association, for, for example, that they are uh, uh, working on this specific uh, issue and uh, audience, everybody. So when we do this performance, for example, in the place of the audience, we put the image of uh, one of, of all of these disappearing people, so that when the audience center should take one of these place and cannot be um, cannot make a distance on this issue, should be inside, should come inside. So I want to show fragment of uh, a performance so that uh, you can have an idea of this work. Thank you. 
Siempre lo mismo contestan Te traes quiere hechos, ya no más palabras ¿Quieres justicia? Dime de qué hablas Es una palabra que aquí ya no tiene validez Solo hay que ver de los mismos que la crearon Respetan la ley, así de mal estamos Creo que muchos ya saben la situación Ya saben para qué es el dinero Para los gustos de ese cabrón Yo no respeto a quien no respeta mi hogar Soy el presidente, maldito el día en el que se quiso postular Por respeto y por obligación renuncie Su muerte ya no la busque Vayas a la casa de millones que acaba de construir Diga a alguien que si quiere ya no hay nada más que decir Ya sabemos que sus familias están por perder No somos todos, nos faltan 43 Ya sabemos que sus familias están por perder No somos todos, nos faltan 43 No somos todos, nos faltan 43 last thing that I want to say is uh, that for me to, to go to the new West is important also to, to rediscover the social and the political function of the theatre. Thank you. Thank you very much for two very, very rich presentations, which also open for us, I think, many ideas about uh, what is new, what is old, what is past, what's present. And I would just propose a series of words that seem to have come through the presentations this morning um, so that we may actually uh, uh, go forward with more conversation. And it would seem to me that newness and memory connect with each other in very difficult combinations. And it's something that I, I would imagine would be a concern for all of us who work in theatre making as well as in, in art making and writing. The other thing that I think would be important is the nature of dialogue, participation, and a word which I think you used, which is, uh, I think, quite critical, uh, I think, today, is the word, did you say contamination? Yes. And I would say that I think that's extremely important today what, what is contamination and what is dialogue 
and whether in some senses that connects up to our understanding of memory as well. And then I would say the words empathy and participation and I would like to introduce the word uh, dissonance over here which I would like to say perhaps is equally important as in, in theatre or in, in any kind of making processes where we, uh, where we inflect the word participation which could also mean that we can also see ourselves as saying I am not a homogenized audience, I am somewhat different and I would also make clear in my head why I'm different and I think in in today's moment in, 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 in various kinds of histories across the world this understanding that I may be different from a certain kind of community being made via the theater I may see differently is also part of the freedom that you talk about in terms of the politics of theater making and it would it would uh, I think perhaps thinking on these would also become quite urgent because um, the natures of participation in today's uh, kind of digital world where you can press a button and participate whether that's actually democratizing or whether that's standardizing whether that's taking away that's actually only a number what do we mean by participation in a situation where the actual participation means pressing a button and giving a tick or being part of voting which would be actually a sort of in some senses ghost voting towards things that actually will not change anything other than an award or something like that. I'm thinking of voting for, let us say, uh, India's Got Talent or uh, things like this. So I would say that each of the words that have so, uh, you know, so finally come in in the morning uh, would be words that we might think to uh, take our conversation further. And it would, I think that one part for a for a country like India where we have long traditions of performance. Memory plays a very important role because memory also is about forgetting and what is forgotten at what time is a political act, I think. And I think maybe we might bring these questions out so the house is open and questions and dialogues, I hope, will be done. <laughs> And then we were lucky enough to begin the project 
in Iceland where we had a residency. And then we continued it in London because of questions around flying to other parts of the world and um, all of that stuff. So very quickly, like the, the problems presented of globality in terms of resource resource use, both financial and ecological, became um, one of the logistical factors that determined how we constructed our process. Um, we were also at the first, in the, we had three stages of research. So the first one was in Iceland, and it was very much exploratory, like we just kind of threw everything into the mix and just tried things. We went for walks, we had discussions, we made we made scenes, and then when we came back to London, we threw everything away that we had made because that was the first scratch, and it didn't say anything new or interesting, but it was an important part for us to kind of tease out uh, how and just kind of flex our muscles in exploration. The second uh, research process that we had. Um, we worked with Richard, who became his director, uh, who thinks leader should be on climate change. Um, we invited him uh, from Berlin to come and work with us, and in that respect, we that was when we got very stuck, because um, at that point we became uh, very stuck in the discussion, the, the discussion about all of the implications of, of what we were doing, as well as how, how um, art has been formed historically around its relationship to nature. And so it, it, it became very academic and not very theatrical, uh, which was also very important for a, a completely blowing apart our assumptions that we brought to the table in terms of making work about this issue, as well as for us to push how, how we understood this to be not an issue-based piece of work, but rather something that speaks to our new condition and understanding the new um, condition of humanity within this, this ecological construct and how, how we come to where we are today. Um, and then the third part was very much about creating, actually sitting down and doing the, the technical parts of making with theatre. And in that, we brought in a director because until then we had tried to work very democratically. Um, because tradition beforehand, the pieces of theatre that we created had two people in it. But we discovered when you add a third person in to the devising process, things get just like, infinitely more complicated in terms of voices at the table, managing um, choices that are made, uh, how we make those choices, who has the final words. So we decided to actually go back to a more traditional system of theatre making just because otherwise nothing would have come done. <laughs> So out of the process, we came up with a manifesto for our company, and one of the lines is we will follow in turn, and that became a very important uh, linchpin of our creative process generally, is that um, de democratic working doesn't necessarily mean that every voice is uh, has equal has equal time. It's a goal, each person will have a role that we agree on, and that is how we agree to go forward together in a respectful and fruitful manner. Um, so, and then out of that came, came the show. And in terms of the relationship to the climate change as a global issue, it became something from which we could draw metaphors and um, imagery, but it didn't become the story of the play, but rather the what gave it color. And what it was more about was about interpersonal relationships, how and how we go forward or we choose not to go forward together. And, and that was more the, the journey and the, the underlying arc of the play. As well as um, the set, I didn't speak very much about it because it would be a bit of a side step. Was, um, it was all waste material reclaimed from Reading Festival. Um, so music festivals in the UK, after they finished, have a lot of waste left behind. And huge, uh, huge groups about a week cleaning them up. That includes just toss away tents, sleeping bags. It's a really wasteful endeavor. So we decided that part of the ecological story would be using waste material and letting that paint the the ecological context because the 
the, the environment of the theater space that we created is completely artificial and slowly over time the characters do more of their humanity and become more visibly and on the design side become more part of, of a plastic environment. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about those lecture theater plays, and I'm not sure it was done by your. Uh, I'm not sure it was done by your collective, but I no, But I'm curious to hear about it. Uh, I'm curious from, I guess, two perspectives, and um, my, my thoughts are not fully formed, but I'm trying to express it. So first of all, uh, uh, from the point of view of activism, we need to. Uh, how to put it, to narrate or to, to uh, produce um, fiction of, of a real problem. Um, we need to speak about uh, um, we need to speak about uh, uh, global warming and this utopian future in the setting of the uh, theater, which is interesting. And uh, so that's one thing. The other thing, the possibility of showing a lecture as a theater play, and maybe the fact that we are speaking about future, in theater usually we speak about the present, the past, we speak about the future, maybe there is some connection, but I'm, I'm curious because I don't know exactly how it works. So it was a lecture, just in a, in a theater, or was there was something additional? Um, okay, so the, the day works. Uh, theatricalized lectures. So I have a quote that I left out um, from the director, Katie Mitchell. Uh, let me just find it for you. And it kind of explains why she decided to undertake these these two pieces. And um, so was, my point has always been that I didn't I didn't want the possibility of these changes referring to ecological changes occurring for my child to say to me in 30 years, "Did you know? Why did you do anything?" I could not act, I couldn't not act because I wanted to be accountable to my daughter in the future. So these pieces were very much um, about addressing um, the, la the fact that scientists often feel like they're shouting into a void. They have this immense information and it's just, it's just falling on deaf ears with this, the sensation of, from the point of view of the scientific community and her idea was to put these science, scientists on stage in a more digestible format. So while they were giving the key um, science, the key climate change science, they weren't doing it in the traditional way of at a podium. It was in a much gentler, much more human way and leaving in their personal experiences as scientists. But because the main impetus for, and, and what these people know, they're not actors, they're scientists. And what they do is science, and what they, they educate people about is science. So the, the end product ended up being very quite heavy um, because the, the, the mode of storytelling that they're used to, that, that they're comfortable imparting, is science. But Katie Mitchell was a very talented director and managed to incorporate theatrical tropes into, into how these lectures were delivered and shape it and mold it so that it did become, they both became theatrical events in the World Court Theatre, which is, has quite progressive programming around climate change. So essentially it was taking the information to new audiences in ways in which they could access. Uh, but my argument was more perhaps we need to take it a step further. And Chris Gray, please, is the second scientist, would argue as well that the creative sector is time for us to take up the mantle of this question and make it our own because scientists can only go here so far. So if I might abuse my privilege and ask a question that uh, I think for me something that's leading me to think. When you say tradition, uh, what is it that you actually imply? Uh, is, it, uh, is it certain languages that have been drawn from various times or what, what would that imply in a work and works that you make? 
in, with tradition, I'm, uh, I have, I'm referring uh, to the performing arts tradition. So, um, something that we come from our uh, background, for example, I don't know, in Italy it can be comedy and laughter, it can be a tradition, mm -hmm. or some songs um, of the south of Italy that we use in performance, uh, this is a tradition, but also uh, some form that is not coming from uh, performing arts, but maybe it's coming from other things, for example, ritual action, uh, or a sort of uh, ceremony, um, um, like, uh, for example, related, to, for example, with uh, religious things. So, all of these uh, materials are um, our tradition, our baggages that we can use it and uh, we can understand to, uh, first to understand what we are, where we, we are coming, so, and then uh, to create this intercultural dialogue. So, because uh, uh, we, if we know our traditions, we can establish a relation with the, um, other people coming from other traditions. And, and that this dialogue can be very interesting and can create something new. Yes, for, for example, in the video that we show, uh, the video of the session, for example, for example, Nicola was um, working with the Indian dancer and they were using different traditions to communicate. The traditions that were coming from performing arts in that case and especially to the body language. Yes. If I may just... Uh, oh, just put put out another idea which some, I think engages all of us here. One of it would be uh, that when actually one takes vocabulary which has had a history, then when it is embodied in today's time, then it's already changed. And do we mark that as new? Is it something that we say is new? Is it invented? In other words, are we inventing the tradition or reinventing the tradition? or are we carrying it uh, in, in, in a different time into a zone? It's something yeah, that I yes. think we all worry we about. Were, we were using, for example, the, um, the, the terms updating the tradition. So, like bringing it to the contemporary time, and of course, uh, bringing it to the contemporary time, something is changing. Yes. But what I think is, is new is in the, in the dialogue and not only to update something yeah. so that coming from my tradition, but in the dialogue to create That's something true. new. So I use, for example, one element coming from um, Brazilian tradition, putting together with Korean elements, and then what we create is something, of course, that is new, that before doesn't exist. Any other thoughts and questions? Is it possible to ask Yes. I have already abused my privilege. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, you said something interesting. Sorry, I didn't get your name. Your name, I So uh, you said something interesting about the fact that while you are creating, you're not thinking about creating something new. And you're thinking, I'm not sure if I remember correctly, about expressing yourself. And I thought maybe that means it's an interesting point and I thought maybe you can discuss this now. Yes, uh, because as I said before, something new is a very general thing. And I think uh, um, for, for an art is everything is subjective. So um, when I create something, I, I think to express what in that specific 
specific moment I want to express, what I want to say. And I try to don't repeat myself. So I try to, to go um, to something that I don't know, to explore, to make a research. Um, and in that way, I create maybe something new. But it's not this my intention. My intention is to go deep in something that in that moment I want to do. And to, to let, uh, uh, um, to be open, to be free, to, to don't be um, conditioned or uh, influenced by uh, what when they are around, uh, or, or maybe some uh, pressure that, of course, we can have to create something. So it, it's for this that I think that freedom is the most important thing that as artists we have, or we need to, to use, and also uh, to understand for real why we are free. Mm. And, and not when we are just uh, doing things for attitude because we have we have this attitude of, because we learn this and then we try to repeat or maybe because somebody liked what you did before and is asking to you to do the same things. Please. I feel like they're all becoming new, but I find very exciting is for the piece that we did yesterday. Um, it was a piece that we made three years ago, and we performed it intermittently. And um, coming back to that piece, I'm reinventing it and refilling it with all the creative processes that I've had um, in the years in between its creation. Um, has been. Uh, it feels like a new piece to me again, and the way that I perform it is drastically different from the way that I engage with it as an artist. And what I think it's saying is drastically different than when we first conceived of it. Even just performing something that's intimate to me within a context that I'm really unfamiliar in, even that juxtaposition of energies uh, fills, fills it with something that's new and vibrant and exciting. And I think that's what's super exciting about performing your own work or devising your own work, not with the intention of being new, but seeing how every time you go back to it, it is this new and migrant thing that, that kind of grows with you or without you, you know? Well, I, um, if there are no other questions, let me just um, mark today's, uh, some of the conversations. I think that uh, some, of the, some of this work that, you know, which looks to the future on the one hand, but also has to deal with the past. When you say that Katie Mitchell says, this is for my daughter, who it looks, I see her in the future. I think one of the things that seems to me very critically important is the fact that there are certain suppressions of memory and the past, which seem to be very much a part of at least uh, certain art practices in our region. and. Uh, I think the suppressions are the ones that we might need to look at as, as uh, memory being in, in fact a kind of history of uh, forgetting. And so uh, for us to be working as a m m making work which looks at political action that should take us into the future, I think has to have these vexed dialogues. Mm -hmm. And I think today's um, uh, presentations have taken us through the uh, processes of making such dialogues and I think in that itself is some part of the concern for the future but also for the politics in terms of working in the present. So thank you very very much for being here and for sharing your ideas and thank you for actually taking us through the processes of your making and thank you all for being 
part of the session. Thank you, thank you very much. I, am, I have not really earned the right to say that it's a wonderful session because I was running inside and outside for other managerial responsibilities of mine. But I uh, believe that you must have enjoyed the session with such learned uh, speakers, chair and the audience. We will start our next session at 2 p.m. The details of the next session is uh, uh, outside only. There is a little change as Ms. Daksha said is not being able to come and she was supposed to do the chair. Mr. Nicola Pianzola will uh, chair. He has kindly agreed no. to <laughs> the chair. So we all meet at two in the same room. <laughs>